Go on, give them a second. Yeah, we can start recording. Well, everybody, thank you very much for joining for this emerging specialty series. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces here. And uh, we're here to speak a little bit about critical care cardiology. It's a field I've been lucky enough to join in, in a really exciting time. And I'm really honored to have two of my longtime mentors here, been big parts of drawing me into the dark side and also very inspiring people who've really had a lot of vision for the career. And I was hoping to present to you this talk entitled A New Rhythm for the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit. And it's sort of giving you a sense of the past, present, and future uh, from the perspective of two of the people who really helped get this specialty off the ground. Oh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Jason Katz. He is now at Duke, but by way of medical school at UNC, residency at UT Southwestern, and cardiology and critical care fellowship at Duke. Uh, also did a master's of health science at their com combined program through NIH and Duke. And he is currently the director of the cardiovascular critical of, of cardiovascular critical care. I uh, was previously at UNC and has been a big leader in uh, many of the critical care cardiology initiatives. Some of the research between uh, C3TN, which is the critical care cardiology trial network hosted through Brigham and Timmy. Uh, he's also one of the co-directors of uh, one of the recent annual car critical care cardiology symposiums, bringing the world together, and numerous other ACC efforts, and has also published some of the seminal articles in our field. So, Jason, thank you very much for being here. And Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That's uh, quite a generous introduction. Uh, makes me feel a little bit old, uh, but I supplied you with a picture that didn't have much gray hair, so i uh, <laughs> trying to trick the audience here. Now, I, I did some color replacement as well. Excellent. <laughs> this will be fun. I'm looking forward to this. Excellent. Then we have Chris Barnett, who I work with closely at UC and has also been a mentor of mine uh, for the last few years. And I'm really excited that he came to join us at UC. I feel very lucky. He came or did his training at or medical school at Northwestern, residency Northwestern, then did critical care fellowship first at NIH and then fell in love with cardiology and flew across the country to UCSD where he started combining the two. And he had, first came up to uh, SFGH and then left California and went to DC and got wise and then came back to UC. But he's currently the chief of our critical care cardiology section, as well as the director of inpatient cardiology at UCSF. He has been a leader in many of the same uh, initiatives as Jason has, a C3TN steering committee member. He's also a member of the ABM critical care board exam and has some really unique insights I'm hoping he'll share with us about how double-boarded cardiologists have expanded in the United, or well, sort of launched in the United States and where we are today. Uh, he's also an internationally recognized leader in pulmonary hypertension as part of ISHL, ISHLT, uh, and has numerous landmark publications on shock teams and pH and rare subtypes. Chris, good to see you. Thanks, Connor. Half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. It's a very generous introduction also. Excellent. So, you know, to take us through, I would like to uh, keep this open to chat questions and really keep it informal. I'm, the slide burden is pretty light and I want people to, what I'm trying to set up here is a history of CCUs and critical care cardiology in sort of a short format and to give you a sense of where Jason and Chris entered the field and have them sort of guide us on their journey and where the field has gone since they've joined and the future directions. And so CCUs really uh, can be dated back to Desmond Julian uh, back in the 60s, who in uh, Edinburgh, the Royal Infirmary uh, created a co-localized unit where they would try to deliver early, initially open cardiac massage and then moved on to defibrillation, but through a coordinated team that delivered early therapy and operationalized all the members of the critical care team, including nurses. Thomas Killip uh, brought some further granularity to the field, finding people with ACS who were at the highest risk for, AC or for arrhythmias and collapse and further operationalized teams and was one of the people who's credited with getting nurse or teaching nurses to defibrillate patients and recognize arrhythmias at their onset. And as you can see, from these early interventions, just from simple defibrillation and uh, co-localization of patients and facilitating pattern recognition, 
there's a big drop in mortality associated with ACS. Anticoagulants come along and drop that mortality a little bit further. Lytics come along, maybe drop a little bit further and that sort of overlaps with PCI. And this drops us into the modern day mortality of ACS around two to 3% that we all enjoy and sort of a routine condition for us. You overlay cardiogenic shock following ACS over that and it's very high mortality back in the 60s was around 80% and small, obviously very small patient subset or uh, analyses, but nonetheless very provocative. And there isn't as much progress until therapeutics are impl implemented and PCIs, uh, lytics and PCI are brought out with gusto and shock. And then we see a big drop in mortality, which is where these MCS devices come out after PCI and all the systems that facilitate early PCI are started to implement between EMS, hospital recognition, STEMI call. Uh, and we see a real plateau in the mortality of both ACS and uh, cardiogenic shock following ACS. And moving also in the background of all of these events, we can overlay this on this timeline. We see that there's a lot of public health interventions in the U.S. limiting smoke or putting uh, early health warnings on cigarettes, bans on cigarette advertising, blood pressure control becomes more of an initiative. Statins are introduced, oh, um, and uh, then mo moving forward, or sorry, overlaying that, we see where we get to back to the 2000s. We see this plateau. And the reason I wanted to sort of outline this is where this is where we're getting into the sort of more modern cardiology and more modern patient demographics, a lot less ACS. And right around this time, we have two <laughs> spring chickens pop out <laughs> and they're coming out of training in this new environment. And I think it's interesting to sort of put that in context and because they're coming out at a time when PCI is hot people are trying to, or, you know, there's a lot of focus on early PCI and shock. And there's this evolving tide that in retrospect seems very clear, but I think at the time probably wasn't. And I wanted to start off by having Jason, or when I asked Jason, uh, when you were training, I was hoping maybe you could share with people sort of where critical care cardiology was then and what gave you the sense of this bay of a potentially changing tide. Yeah, thanks. That was a, a great uh, yeah, introduction for sure. And, um, you know, a little background, you know, I, when I did my residency at UT Southwestern, um, I became uh, enamored by critical care medicine. And at, at the time, it was sort of pulmonary critical care bust. So that was the, the route that I was going to go. And I really enjoy taking care of patients in the modern medicine ICU, not so much in love with outpatient pulmonary medicine, but uh, but the inpatient ICU experience was great. And I'll, I'll tell you, um, before I was selected as chief resident, I, I had half the applications filled out and ready to go uh, for pulmonary critical care. And I put them aside and then uh, rounded in the, uh, the cardiac ICU at uh, UT Southwestern. And I'll be honest with you uh, and completely transparent, I loathed the idea of rounding in the cardiac ICU. I I thought most of the people that decided they were going to go into cardiology were a bunch of pretentious guys that like to quote every 20,000 patient clinical trial and every acronym uh, that existed in clinical trials around uh, acute coronary syndrome management and PCI. And I thought that's really all there was in the cardiac ICU because that's what I had grown up learning. Those were units for patients with acute coronary syndromes, acute myocardial infarction, and that's it. And then I rounded in the unit and fell in love with acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock. You know, you're always influenced by people that become your mentors. And two of my mentors, Mark Drasner and Clyde Yancey, were my attendings in that unit. And, and, and they made me fall in love with acute care heart failure. And that was the route that I thought I was going to go. And I came to do, to do my fellowship and rounded in the CICU, again, uh, expecting it to be largely an acute coronary syndrome unit. And, and I was fascinated by how diverse um, the patient populations were, how, how diverse the uh, pathophysiology of disease was, how variable the illness severity, how much procedural needs there was, how much multi-system organ dysfunction. It wasn't what I expected the cardiac ICU to look like. And then I began to sort of think, you know, it's quite possible that there's a, uh, a route for uh, training and career development in the cardiac ICU. There was a real need, I thought, to to understand management of multi-system organ dysfunction and acute 
uh, critical illness among cardiovascular cohorts of patients. And I remember rounding in there one time with uh, uh, Rob Califf, who's now our uh, FDA commissioner. Uh, and at the time he turned to me and said, Jason, why are we doing things in this unit the same way we've done them for the last several decades? And I said, I don't know. I've been ask, asking myself that same question. And, and it made me uh, want to sort of learn more about how these, these units have evolved right under our noses without us uh, necessarily advancing the care of patients outside of acute coronary syndrome. To be sure, we had gotten really good at intervening on, a, on occluded coronary arteries and modifying, you know, platelet activation and aggregation in acute coronary syndromes. But I thought we knew much less about uh, pharmacologic and mechanical support for cardiogenic shock. I thought we knew a lot less about the influence of renal and pulmonary and hepatic dysfunction in, in cardiac disease. And, and that, you know, I thought was a unique opportunity for someone young like myself that still had this passion for critical care, um, but also was interested in an investigation to sort of think about these things. So, you know, I, rounding in the unit, you know, and I've always found that I, uh, I, I come up with questions, both from a clinical and investigative standpoint, based on what I see and what I touch and what I feel uh, during uh, my clinical care. And that's why I've never wanted to take myself away from the bedside for too long, because that's what inspires me. Uh, what I see, what I don't know, what I have the possibility to learn, and um, and what the patients need and what they tell me. Um, and so I saw this uh, clearly evolved care and I wanted to sort of prove that as well. And so uh, one of the projects I did during my uh, research training at, at Duke was um, an investigation in, uh, in temporal trends in the cardiac ICU, just, and this is it right here, a, a sort of a, a nearly 20 year um, epidemiologic uh, uh, evaluation, largely a descriptive study um, of changes in the coronary care unit at Duke over a, a nearly two decade period. And, and that, that showed me a little bit, well, sort of confirmed what I believe, but also showed me um, how that field had really evolved um, in front of us. Maybe we can, before we get into some of the data, you know, what is, I think this is always a really interesting story. I've heard you talk about it informally but you know, I, whenever I when I first read this paper and I saw it was in the SCCM journal, I thought yeah. like you know this is a pretty big seminal paper and it's not even in a cardiology journal. I was like, wonder maybe you could share some of that. <laughs> Wasn't considered that story. seminal at the time, Connor. I promise you that. I mean, <laughs> you know, I wrote the paper and spent a lot of time on this paper and uh, uh, I thought it was pretty darn good and I was pretty happy with it. And it took. You know, I shopped it to really almost every cardiovascular uh, journal uh, as, as a paper and, and largely was rejected based on priority. Uh, they just didn't feel like there was high enough priority to publish this. And so, you know, I wanted it to get in the hands of cardiologists because, uh, and people with an interest in cardiovascular medicine, because I thought those were the people that I needed to convince uh, that we needed to focus on this patient population from from a clinical care perspective, from a research perspective, from a training perspective, from a staffing and, and structure perspective, I just couldn't couldn't do it. And uh, so uh, ultimately, I went to critical care medicine. At the time, critical care medicine uh, was run. The editor in chief of critical care medicine uh, was Joe Perillo. So Joe, actually, uh, you can really if you you know some people have called me a, a grandfather in this field. If that's the case, Chris Barnett is also a grandfather. <laughs> It's relatively depressing, but if I'm a grandfather in this field, then Joe Perillo is a great grandfather in this field because, you know, he did critical care and cardiology and spent most of his career uh, in that area from a clinical perspective, but also sort of investigating among number of other things, sort of sept sepsis induced cardiac dysfunction uh, and the role of uh, sepsis and cytokines in, in myocardial dysfunction and acute illness. And um, so he, uh, he was the editor in chief of critical care medicine, and I struck up a, a friendship with him through through this paper that he ultimately was willing uh, to publish after <laughs> several several revisions. It was funny, you know. I included a lot of these people, these names that you've seen as experts, certainly in the field of cardiology, including the aforementioned Rob Califf, the guy at the end. Rick Becker was actually a, an outside the box thinker as well, who who married uh, at the time hematology because of his interest in thrombosis, hematology and cardiology. At a time when he did that, people thought that was insane. Uh, uh, and he proved them wrong, but he was 
willing to support me to think outside the box, much in the same way people supported him to think outside the box. Um, um, so, you know, I, I included a lot of these folks in, in the investigation. I remember presenting this research to, to a number of faculty members at Grand Rounds and, and Rob Califf raised his hand afterwards after I presented some of this data. He said, great information. I hate to tell you this, Jason, but your, uh, your analysis is tragically confounded. And, and to be sure, he was absolutely right. It was confounded. And, uh, you know, I, I adjusted the analysis uh, uh, in response to that. And again, ultimately published this paper. And, and the nice thing is a guy that I'm also friends with and colleagues with, and I know Chris Barnett and Connor, you are as well, Steve Hollenberg, who recently moved uh, to uh, Emory to run cardiac critical care there, wrote uh, an editorial on this paper. And I, um, you know, you, you, you know, you, uh, uh, you have certain papers uh, that mean uh, the world to you, and they're like your little babies. And this is one I have, you know, framed with Steve's editorial next to it. But yes, because uh, because it got uh, summarily rejected by uh, just about every cardiovascular journal, critical care medicine was its home. That's a labor of love. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, this is one of the first times that some of this data was sort of put side by side showing reduction uh, uh, reduction STEMI, increase in congestive heart failure, increase in end STEMI, rising rates of cardiogenic shock, and then overlying that with increasing rates of sepsis, renal disease, pneumonias, and respiratory failure in CICUs, and looking at those temporal relationships side by side. Fairly provocative data, and you can see it ends in 2006. So it's very yeah. early on analysis. Yeah, right, right at the end of my fellowship. Yeah. A, little, a little just after my fellowship yeah and chris you know so you know, one of the i was hoping that you could share with people when you guys were coming out when you saw what your perception from inside training because i think you know for the trainees in the group and you know it's interesting to always hear what you guys saw as the practice landscape and then maybe roll that into when you went into practice or saw how things were the what the truth was on the ground and how that influenced your thinking about the field you know, I, I think it's really interesting. I think, you know, my experience, uh, it, strangely enough, Joe Perillo was really important for me also because Joe Perillo was one of the early, so I, I did my critical care at the NIH and, and I, I, my path my, ended up in critical care a little differently. I was really torn between cardiology and critical care. And right when I looked at critical care opportunities at the NIH, I realized I could do both. And in fact, the ICU at the NIH was established. It was a cath lab. And it was, uh, it was established to study hemodynamics of shock. And Joe Perlow was one of the investigators there. Um, and many of the faculty that were uh, still there and who I trained with, they, were, uh, they had worked with Joe Perillo uh, before Perillo left there. So I think he's, uh, it, it really is true. I think uh, I, I gave a talk a while back and I think we identified sort of Joe Perillo at the very top of the, uh, the family tree of critical care cardiology. So it's sort of a remarkable guy for his influence. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think that uh, during our training, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, what we were doing um, was not thought to be valuable. Um, I, I definitely had that experience in, in uh, you know, in, at the NIH as a critical care fellow, there were two cardiologists who were critical care. And, and, and that was a very sort of unique environment where you could sort of train forever and you could do critical care in combination with one or two or three other subspecialties, which was not uncommon. Um, outside of the NIH, I, you know, folks were, were either thought I was sort of interesting and, and odd and unusual and didn't really understand me or, or sort of thought that I should just be removed from the, so that from the room, because I, I, I was somehow offensive. Um, the, uh, it, it was tough. And I, I, Jason and I were training at the same time. And I actually remember sitting in the ICU when I was a cardiology fellow, uh, feeling bad for myself one day that I had made these life choices. And uh, I read a paper by Jason Katz and Jack, and I was like, holy crap, there's somebody else like me out there. <laughs> so it was, uh, and, and actually, I think, Jason, I emailed you like shortly after that and was like, I'm Chris, I've, I've done this also. What, 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 what do we do next? So I think it was a really uh, challenging environment. It remained that way for a long time. And my first job at UCSF was as a general cardiologist. Um, and uh, where I, I had an extraordinary experience. But, uh, and then, you know, I, I think opportunities in critical care cardiology began to emerge after that. Um, 
uh, is what I, I think definitely the, the landscape now is dramatically different. Um, it, it's, uh, there's tremendous need. Um, there are programs growing, uh, and I spent you know, six, uh, six years on the East Coast uh, in a program there. We recruited multiple critical care cardiologists, had trouble finding enough people to hire. And, and now in San Francisco, we're recruiting uh, critical care cardiologists and hiring up, and there's lots of opportunity. And I I think that the, the, the way that critical care, uh, that cardiac ICUs have evolved has created an enormous need for people like us. And I think that a need is, is really recognized now. Um, I, I think that what we bring to cardiology is sort of being seen differently. It's not just the skill set of taking care of sick people because cardiologists have always taken care of sick people. But what we what we get out of critical care training that's unique and 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 bring to the ICU, I you know I, I I my my feeling is oftentimes that what we learn in critical care is is how to work as a team, how to be multidisciplinary, how to be collaborative, and I think that's something that's different than cardiology training, where the teaching is is oftentimes about procedures, um, and you know the whole package of things you learn as a cardiologist, and we overlay the the running, being how, knowing how to work in an ICU together um, with those cardiology skills. And I think it creates a, a really remarkable, it's a really remarkable synergism. And I, I think having people who know how to run a multidisciplinary team, know how to take care of very sick patients, um, work together with nursing RTs, with all the subspecialties, and also have that cardiology knowledge uh, is, is now important and, and necessary. And uh, these kind of very sick people who, and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when, um, when I was in residency, I think I saw a balloon pump once or twice. My, I trained at Northwestern, which is a fairly good institution, but we had no transplant, no LVAD, no ECMOs. Um, so people who that we take care of now, uh, you know, would have, they, they died, they didn't survive. They, and uh, so they, they, we didn't have ICUs with these folks like Jason showed so nicely in that paper. Um, and really the, the needs for people like us has, the need for people like us has, has grown out of this changing population. And also I think we've now, you know, after, after getting to know us, uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're, our value is increasingly seen, um, by, uh, by intensivists and by cardiologists. Um, so we really have, we really have folks like Joe Perlow to thank for getting the ball rolling and, and starting us on our way. You know, I could keep things. talking, Connor, so stop yeah. me when it's time. No, it's good. I mean, there's all in hearing of what you guys have gone through to establish the field, I think is important because it sort of informs, especially as a young faculty for me, very much informs how I approach conversations and establish and try to figure out things that have worked and translated to other people, sort of figure out how to communicate our value, our skill set, and how we work well with others, you know, where we can help take care of patients in a slightly different way. So I very much value a lot of the way you guys structure your sentences. Having heard you speak and say things multiple times, I know it's very intentional, the words you use, and it carries a lot of, uh, has carried a lot of lessons for me. <laughs> so, and one of the things I think, I was hoping you could actually share, speaking to your point about uh, the practice environment and just like where you guys, or where you came from talking and the value add in ICUs, working multiple scenario team. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about this paper where your, your survey paper and to introduce it. Um, this is a paper Chris worked on with Sam Bruska, one of our other soon to be faculty at UC. And they surveyed all dual boarded physicians as, that were registered with the ABAM, both in critical care and cardiology. And there is a group of people who were practice pathway who grandfathered in and uh, then the other, the minority of these people were double boarded by the traditional modern standard. Um, and Chris, I was hoping you could talk some of the lessons here, talk about how the ABIM or how these statistics have shifted and yeah. how this informs opportunity and need that you were describing across it. And the thing that stands out to me is multiple practice settings, not just academic tertiary centers. Yeah, yeah you know, and I, I think this is really interesting and in there's a, uh, uh, to add a little texture to this, the um, the in the nineties when the critical care medicine board exam became available for the first time, the ABM offered two cycles of the exam, I believe, uh, where one could be critical could become critical care certified via the practice pathway, which meant that somebody said you practice in an ICU, therefore you're eligible to take the exam. So many cardiologists did at that time take the exam, and and we ended up with a lot of dual certified folks who had not done a critical care medicine fellowship. 
Um, those folks, we, we there were about 120 uh, folks who had been actually who had done a critical care fellowship and a cardiology fellowship at the time we did the survey. And if you saw the total number was 500 and something. So most of those folks now, when we we looked uh, recently at the ABIM uh, data again, the number of dual uh, of dual certified uh, physicians is now much lower. It's about 140 down from about 450. So we've lost most of the people in this original cohort. Uh, likely due to retiring and no longer being in practice. Um, what that's also telling us, and we're investigating this a little bit further now, is that we're not creating very many new critical care cardiologists. The numbers are, are the number of folks who are dual fellowship trained is minimally different than it was when this was published in 20. Uh, the data was collected in 2014. Um, so, or the uh, when when we identified this population. Um, so we're really not training that many more people. I, I think at that time also this reflects the experience that Jason and I had coming out of fellowship when it was very hard to find, there wasn't such a thing as a cardiac intensive care unit to go work in. Um, most of these folks, and I had, I had uh, Sam Bruska, who uh, was the first author on this paper and uh, was also an NIH fellow. Many of these folks, and I, I knew other folks who had trained at the NIH, and many of them were practicing in the community. And as I did, were uh, functioning as general cardiologists because there were no jobs in critical care cardiology. So most of the folks that we we surveyed here were, were practicing other spaces in cardiology. There, there were no jobs in, in critical care cardiology. So that was one that, that was fairly unique here. Um, and then I think, do you, want, do you want me to say more about that or should we go on? No, to no, that? keep going. I'm just pulling my, my question list here. Okay, I was gonna, um, I was. I thought it might be interesting to look at the next slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think this was also really interesting. You can see that the folks who were fellowship trained identified their. Uh, we, we compared the impressions and understanding of the fellowship trained uh, cardiac intensivists versus those who had uh, been certified through the practice pathway, and you can see that the the ones who were fellowship trained in critical care did more critical care. And that was something that I, I suspect if we were to redo this now, we would find that almost all these fellowship trained intensivists or a much higher proportion of them are doing, I, I think we'd find almost zero uh, practice pathway uh, physicians remain. And I think we would find that the number of the uh, dual trained uh, uh, and dual certified folks, that they do much more critical care uh, compared to what this was then. Um, and this is just a, a, a change in the need. I, one of the things that this really highlights, uh, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of demand for people with our training now and our experience. Um, being in a position where I've, uh, of hiring and recruiting at two institutions over the last couple of years, I can, I can share that it is very difficult to find uh, to folks with this training. And there's a, there's, uh, which has created a lot of, you know, because there's a lot of opportunities, created a lot of demand. And I think the demand will continue to grow. Uh, there's not a lot of fellowship programs um, that are really designed to train uh, cardiac intensivists. And Jason and I talk about this and some other colleagues, we talk about this, like how do we staff and meet these needs of cardiac ICUs today? And this is uh, sort of a hot topic of discussion. One of the pathways is to train in critical care. And we're, uh, there are a handful of programs, the MGH program, we're gonna stand up a fellowship for the next year where we're really specifically targeting cardiologists for an additional one year of critical care medicine training. Um, a publication I wrote, uh, where I ended up on acc.org, a, a, a small publication with Ben Kenningsberg a number of years ago. We looked at all the programs, the critical care medicine programs in the country who were willing to, or interested or willing to take cardiologists and looked at the pathway, uh, the training pathway for cardiologists who wanted to train in critical care at those programs. Um, that, and we found a, a significant number of programs who were willing to offer one or two year critical care only training to cardiologists. And I expect that that data is probably from about 2019, 2018. And I, I think if we did that again, we would find that number has increased significantly, mm -hmm. um, although it's still quite small. So I, I think that there's still an enormous need to train folks like us, us there to, uh, to fill, to meet the demand, which will only grow over time. Um, and, you know, training both, uh, identifying ways to train folks in critical care and cardiology, and, and certainly considering uh, other ways to uh, really be uh, skilled and qualified to function in cardiac ICUs, other training pathways that make you skilled to uh, function in cardiac ICUs. 
is an important uh, ongoing topic of discussion. Yeah, and sort of getting into that data actually. So I wanted to, so this, looking at the trends of the data that's come out since your training, you know, we've seen it's very much reflected what a lot of what you're saying and the skill sets that are needed. You know, so we have an aging population. This is from one of our other, uh, our one of our other friends, Shashank, who's out in Inova and does a lot of, has really changed the program there. This is one of his early publications from fellowship showing the proportion of diseases managed in the uh, CICU uh, for primary admission diagnosis. And you can see that infectious complications, respiratory complications, neurologic, pretty much everything has grown as uh, ACS has shrunk. Uh, and then you can also see this as the, as the primary non-cardiac diagnosis trends over time growing. And this is across multiple types of hospitals. So this is multiple environments, not just academic centers. This is true at community hospitals, medium-sized hospitals across the board. Um, very much speaking, Chris, I think the point that you're raising about how generalizable this is. Uh, and cardiogenic shock is you know, something that we're all very acutely aware of, and we spend we all spend a considerable amount of energy thinking about. You know, the the rate of recognition is on the rise, so our opportunity to intervene for patients, I think, is growing. Um, and we also see that we have a not or the fraction that we can run AMI based is is growing as a fraction of that total population. Um, and Jason, I wanted to actually pause real quick because I know you know you, you were at UNC for a while before you went to Duke, and or and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about all this data as it was maturing, how you were adapting and growing the practice and sort of folding it into your growth and research plans in your mid career. Yeah, that's a, that's great, and uh, you know what what strikes me just if I can pause just for one second is. You know, you know why this is such a great field is everyone is sort of equally excited about the field where things are going and each other and each other's success. Uh, and I want the people that are on this webinar to know, like, you know, I consider you guys really uh, great friends and uh, not just great colleagues and co-investigators, but just unbelievable friends. And and it's because we uh, were, you know, we're excited for the field together and we're excited for each is each of our successes as well as our collaboratory successes. So. You know, this is a great time uh, to join the field. And I just, that struck me while I was listening to uh, Chris's uh, soliloquy on uh, <laughs> the field and the ABIM. But uh, yeah, but, you know, a couple of things uh, I think about right now. I mean, A, it was, I was, you know, really pleased to see data like Shashank and data from uh, Elliot Miller and other people, Chris and others, uh, that sort of, corroborated the findings from our single institution study at Duke. Because uh, boy, would I have uh, had egg on my face if uh, everywhere else saw no trends in critical illness, no, none of the similar trends that I had uh, published at Duke. Uh, so thank goodness uh, for colleagues to corroborate uh, uh, what could have been seen as a, a, a dreaded lies uh, from the Duke folks. And uh, uh, so I was pleased with that. You know. Uh, so once we sort of had sort of a epidemiologic uh, characterization of the changes in the cardiac ICU, then we, the next question is, you know, what do we do? Um, and again, if you're a glass half, it depends a lot on if you're a glass half empty or glass half full kind of person. You know, if you're glass half empty, you're like, oh my gosh, things have changed. We're at a staggering uh, uh, a supply demand mismatch and there's no hope uh, for any changes uh, in the future. Uh, oh my gosh, there's no jobs. No one knows what a cardiac ICU is or what a critical care cardiologist does and can add to programs. If you're a glass half full kind of person, it's like you can have a field day. It's such an exciting time. We're right sort of uh, early in the field's maturation. There is uh, innumerable, uh, are innumerable opportunities for investigation. Uh, and not just related to specific disease types or phenotypes, but also how we train people. So, uh, you know, I was talking to someone today who has an interest in med ed uh, uh, and is interested in critical care cardiology. Wow. I mean, what a, what a fertile ground for studying medical education. You know, how we staff these units, how we structure uh, these units. Um, you know, lots of different opportunities for uh, investigation and exploration. And that's what I sort of did. You know, I went over... Uh, again, this is another good story. You know, I, I finished up my training and I, there was no job for me. 
<laughs> I had done all this training and there was, there was no one, no one recruiting me actively for, for this role. I, I cold emailed and called so many people. It's not even funny. And uh, ultimately I, I took a job at UNC based on sort of a, a promise that, you know, there would be opportunities. Uh, and if you were willing to work on establishing uh, this uh, uh, this field locally, uh, then we would try to support you. And that was it. A, a lot of it was sort of a, a leap of faith. You know, now I'm fortunate to mentor people that are being heavily recruited all over the country. And I can assure you that was not my experience. And but you know, I did get there, and and things were open for interpretation and um, uh, evolution. That's not to say that things went super quick. They never do. They never go as quickly. Um, and there were people that, you know, at every institution I've been to that don't understand why I would want to do what I did and, and what I hope to accomplish. And so it was my job to educate and partner, you know, and I, I found both of those things very important. Um, and, and Chris mentioned this as well. You know, one of our major roles is, is not just to take care of critical illness, or specific aspects of critical illness or learn to do all these different procedures in the ICU or manage temporary mechanical support, but also to be the conductor or orchestrator of multidisciplinary team efforts. Um, you know, it's a lot like uh, uh, what the business school for folks learn about, you know, operations and, and how to effectively communicate and orchestrate a, a team-based uh, care dynamic. And so that's what I did. You know, the interesting thing at UNC was there was a big open unit so at any one time, five teams would round in the unit and then round on the floor and on step down. And based on my review of the literature, particularly in non-cardiac critical care populations, as well as the work that I had done, I didn't think that was the best way to deliver critical care to an increasingly sick cardiovascular population or CICU population. And so I spent the better part of a, a year or so trying to convince people that we should you know, close the unit. And, and that, that term, the nomenclature drives some people crazy. And I can understand why when you say closing a unit, it sort of makes people feel like you're closing it off to some of the people that are necessary in the care of these patients. Some of the people that have been involved in the care of these patients for decades, and there's probably a better term, but, but for the purposes of this webinar, we went from an open model to a closed model where there was one critical care team. And, uh, and in order, in order to me, and, and this sort of feels like a, a theme from my career, I sort of had a chip on my shoulder uh, the whole time. And, uh, and it was my job to sort of prove to myself and to others that, this, that these things that we were doing uh, made sense. So almost every aspect, almost every step along the way, I've tried to apply science to it. And so we studied uh, from a before and after perspective, the closing of our cardiac ICU and look not just at heart outcomes like mortality um, and morbidity, but resource consumption in particular, length of stay, uh, and then use of critical care procedures. But, but what I thought was even more important, that was perceptions of care from the nursing staff, uh, from the trainees, the educational experience, uh, and, and a little bit dipping into so, sort of cost of care. And this will lead us, I think, later in the webinar about things that I still think are missing uh, that we need to investigate. So, so I spent the better part of um, you know a year closing that cardiac ICU, and and the, the data that we published, I think, supported that change, uh, and the the culture kind of changed uh, with it. Uh, when I came back to Duke about three years ago, it had been a closed model of care for a, lo a long time, um, and had been run by uh, people with a breath. Uh, and um, lots of experience in caring for sick cardiac patients, people like Chris Ranger and Kristen Newby, who had run the unit for a while. Um, and there were others that were involved in the unit care um, who um, were, you know, were younger and added a fresh perspective. And so I think the pieces were all there, but there were things that we needed to do to evolve. And, and what we've done is expanded, brought in sort of non-traditional uh, critical care providers. I say non-traditional, non-traditional in the cardiology critical care world, and that that includes advanced practice providers, seasoned advanced practice providers. I've run cardiothoracic ICUs where they're they're used uh, and leveraged as uh, you know pivotal team members and have been for quite some time. Uh, we've sort of changed the the training and staffing and structure model, and it's again a, a still still a work in in progress. But we're trying to e evolve. You know, when, when Chris talked about the limitations from a, a, a physician credentialing standpoint, right? I mean, critical care cardiologists don't grow on 
trees. That's that's a good thing and a, and a bad thing. Um, and it's going to be a while before we can have a full sort of cadre of critical care trained cardiologists who can staff all of our cardiac ICUs in academic and non-academic settings alike. I don't think we, we ever will. And so we have to figure out different ways to do it. I don't think that there's one size fits all model. And I think it, a lot of depends on the institutional needs. And so I think every institution largely has to look themselves in the mirror to try to figure this out. And I think we have to be more malleable and nimble about you know, uh, uh, pathways uh, that, leads, uh, that lead to uh, adequate enough training to manage patients in these units. And there's, that's an area sort of a fertile investigation uh, and publication uh, uh, right now. Uh, in, in our unit at Duke, you know, we've, uh, we only have one critical care trained cardiologist and that's myself, but we have some heart failure cardiologists. We have interventional cardiologists, general cardiologists, even a preventive cardiologist. What I was looking for first and foremost, and what I think a lot of places are is sort of passion and drive and dedication to the patients in that unit. That's first and foremost, that's what I wanted to see. Um, and, and that's what I sort of used to help uh, uh, direct who, who staffs that unit right now. Excellent. So I, I think I would like to take a chance because this is a good segue to some of the questions I think that are popping up. Um, and so one of the, and I have a little a few more slides we can just skip over. I think I, I do want to get to that last slide to share with people some of the exciting avenues talking about what uh, some of the things you just mentioned, but uh, from Dr. Goldschlager. Uh, so the question is, how does the panel see their role as attending staff faculty deploy this endeavor in general, first two years of cardiology training programs? Um, and then who owns the patient, the referring cardiologist, who's Who's the ethicist assuming there are, uh, there are some, and is this assumption correct? So. Uh, Let me take a stab. I, I, Nora is, is one of my early mentors and, and colleagues from the uh, San Francisco General. So I, I think I got an idea what Nora's, Nora's getting out of here. And hi, Nora. Um, I, I think I, we, I uh, still owe you a lunch. I'll call soon. Um, but the, uh, yeah, no, I think these are, these are the questions that we still get a lot. And there, there's a sense, um, UCSF is transitioning right now, for, uh, the models of critical care uh, delivery. And I, I think there's always this question of, of who, who is in charge of the patient. And my answer to this is, is always the same as, as there, our job is to make sure the patient, uh, the, as the end cardiac intensivist is to make sure that the care gets delivered that the patient needs. Our job is to be at the bedside. It's to coordinate that, to have face-to-face -face conversations with all the consultants. It's to, to be with the nurses. It's to be there when the patient gets sick. Um, and it's to help establish and put a plan together. Uh, I, I think that the, we, um, I think we should move away from the concept of, you know, there's somebody in charge. I, I think that's not the way we practice critical care anymore, certainly not in cardiac ICUs. I, I have a sick patient right now who's awaiting transplant, and, and there's a lot of services involved, and it's it's not about who's uh, who dominates. It's about who can and can best, uh, how can we get this patient to their destination? And, you know, I, I think even the, the ideas of autonomy and independence really need to be reconsidered. I, I think that, you know, what, what really is a more important and more advanced skill than being autonomous and independent is actually working together. And there's, you know, and, and making sure that all the care is, that all the care is coordinated, that all the conversations happen, and that there's a, a vision for the care that needs to be delivered and carrying out that care delivery. So I, I don't think that there's, it's not a concept of ownership, it's a concept of we're the ones in charge who are responsible for making sure that all the care that needs to be delivered is delivered in the right way and uh, you know work with the entire team. Um, it, I, I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on that. But I think, I mean, it's, I think it's interesting how what all the things that you guys have said, the language you use, and it rings true for a lot of complex uh, programs or, you know, structural or structural programs, complex revascularization programs. A lot of times things are reviewed by a committee and there's a heart team and the concept that multiple people who have different expertise and can discuss a case openly and collegially and collaboratively 
usually delivers the best care to the patient. And I think that our field does a lot of that. Uh, and it's not by accident, it's definitely intentional, but we do it by the bedside. And so we don't have meetings every day. We do it through multidisciplinary rounds, calling lots of consultants, having in Chris and I were just on a call earlier today. And a lot of the times I feel like we come to solutions. It's just the solution is more face-to-face time with consultants, people who were who just had procedures and were taking care of them post. Um, and just working, creating more closed loop communication and figuring out how to do that efficiently. Um, there's another question here. So thank you for this talk. You're, we're happy to do it. Um, as someone interested in critical care cardiology, how to choose an ideal critical care program after cardiology fellowship as a structure is quite variable across programs. Uh, I can take a little stab at that, but then Connor, I think you're probably best situated to answer that having, having thought about it more recently. You know, when I, I went through, I, I wound up just creating a <laughs> critical care position within pulmonary critical care and joined that program for a year based on you know, an ABIM loophole that allowed me to do that and then ultimately sit for the boards. Fortunately, there are a growing number of, of cardiac critical care as well as sort of standalone uh, critical care programs in the country. For instance, you know, here at Duke, there are two critical care spots every year. One is almost always reserved for a cardiologist interested in cardiac critical care. That, you know, that didn't exist, obviously, when I was a cardiology fellow here. I think um, that's, I think there are, um, again, a sort of a glass half full and glass half empty in terms of the differences and variations in training opportunities across the, the country. And I think, you know, as, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into choosing a program. I think most have sort of general, uh, generalized structures that allows uh, people to sit for the ABIM boards. There's some necessity around uh, that uh, training, which I think probably Chris can speak to with more uh, expertise. Um, but there are some variations in the amount of time and exposure you, uh, you have in certain uh, surgical ICUs, for instance, with certain procedures, um, with the research uh, time, et cetera. And so I think uh, now it's, you're kind of blessed a little bit that you have an opportunity to sort of check out programs and sort of get a feel for them. And, 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 and finally, you know, there are graduates of the program, so you can actually talk to the, the different graduates. There are geographic reasons that you make these decisions as well. I mean, you know, uh, we talked about the, when I talked about the need to develop sort of different models to meet the needs of our trainees and that we have to sort of think outside the box, uh, we have to do that for a variety of reasons. One is, is because of sort of financial solvency and family issues, et cetera. You know, adding another year, going to another institution for a year can be very hard uh, for some people. Uh, depending on the, uh, their needs and the stages of their life and career. And not to mention, it's super expensive to do that for another year and put off the, you know, defer the loans for another year and defer, uh, you know, a real salary for another year. And so that's, that said, you know, if we're going to Im- increase the number of people that are coming through this field, we have to make it more financially viable. There's diversity issues in my mind. Um, and so some of those things that you want to think about when you explore programs is, you know, is their, their history or their interest in expanding diversity. You know, like one out of every three cardiac ICU patients is a woman. Uh, nearly one out of every two is non-white, but we have less than 5% critical care uh, cardiologists as women, less than 10% as, you know, you know non-white. And so we need, I feel very strongly about the need to sort of try to match uh, uh, physicians with uh, patients for a variety of reasons. And um, we need to do a better job of that and making it a, uh, a viable field for, uh, for others um, that are interested in, in doing it, particularly uh, our women colleagues. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, when you think about programs, I think you have to think of all of those things. And nothing is ever better than speaking to someone that's gone through the program. So, Con- Connor, you've been through a program more recently. Maybe you can, yeah. can add to that. Yeah, I'm going to try to be really concise. And obviously, I'm happy. To, I, these are long conversations. So any and all of you uh, who are out there, my email is readily available, uh, connor.obrien at ucsf.edu. I'm happy to speak to anybody offline because these are difficult conversations. Not difficult, but there's a lot to think about. Uh, my general advice is think about the skills that you don't have and think about the skills that you want for your job. Uh, in general, a lot of what you get from critical care fellowship 
ventilator management, neurological emergencies, uh, in a lot of multidisciplinary care, you can get at a lot of tertiary centers. Um, and I think for people who want to do critical care cardiology outside of CV ICU or like post cardiac surgery ICUs, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, if you want to get into cardi post cardiac surgical units or MCS, that does change where you pursue training and tends to be a big differentiator uh, in critical care training programs. And also the one of the truth is also is like, that's where a lot of the jobs and expansion are. Uh, there's a lot of need in expanding MCS programs and new MCS programs. Um, and so thinking about how to get that training if you didn't get it in general fellowship is a big part of, uh, I think, fellowship selection. Um, let me get to some of these other questions real quick here, so, or not real quick, but in light of differences in practice and responsibilities of various hospitals, how do you approach maintaining procedural skills? Um, so it depends on where you are. Uh, I can tell you at UCSF, I attend both in the CICU as well as I'm on the critical care team. And I do airways when I'm on the critical care team. I think you know, being in a, when you're taking on a job, a lot of time having those discussions up front as to what your procedural responsibilities are and your the expectations for your role uh, is a really important thing for or maintaining procedures. There is something I do like to highlight to people though, is that you know it is really hard to stay good. And a lot of the time, especially in our most sick patients, you know, you don't have the opportunity for errors. So there is, I, I try to walk people off that ledge a lot of the time thinking, oh, I need to do all my own airways. I need to do all that, you know, you need to be able to intervene in emergencies, stay fresh. And a lot of the time I actually inter intubate with the anesthesiologist and they continue to teach me even at bedside when we're doing procedures together. So there's a lot of opportunities to do that creatively, but I try to make sure people don't get too anchored on it because when you need, when you have things that are really complex, you want the best person in the building to do it. You know, and we're realistically, we're all competent, but we're not, we didn't take four or five years to train doing it. Um, so thinking about that is a big part of your initial job uh, or bargaining, but it's also part of something that you want to put in context to greater goals of your career, I think. Chris yeah, and Jason, would you ask to everything in there? Agree. Yeah, I completely agree with what you said. I mean, there for some people, you know, airway management is is really important to them. That's a big part of their career and they want that to continue to be a big part of your career. And so absolutely, I think you should maintain that skill set. For about 11 years over at uh, UNC, I probably did about, you know, four innovations, <laughs> lots of bronchoscopies and other procedures, but, but like four innovations because there was a, you know, an, an airway team that was there 24 seven. And not only did they, you know, come with their laryngoscopes, but they came with the, the video uh, laryngoscope and they came with all their drugs and all their tools. And, and, you know, I, I would think to myself, if that was my father, who would I want uh, intubating? And, and, you know, I had it, you have to sort of, you know, humble yourself a little bit. When I came back to Duke, there was a little bit more of a need for me to do it in the cardiothoracic ICU where I would around. So I spent a little time in the operating room, just kind of re reacquainting myself to some of those skills. And again, I, you know, I, uh, I can, I can and do establish airways when it's urgent or an emergent in a, in a otherwise sort of stable environment. I, I much prefer having the airway team uh, do that. There are other skills that, that are uh, really important to me that I didn't want to lose and that I focused on main, maintaining through uh, through uh, patient care simulation and other other aspects. So I think it's you know important to think about what what is most important to you matters to you and what the institution needs as well. So let me look here. The um, given the fact that we are we aren't currently training enough cardiology fellows in critical care, can we discuss how programs are trying to build contemporary cardiac ICU programs with only a small number of cardiac intensivists intensivists? And how does a recent graduate incorporate themselves into a tertiary care program uh, if they are the first one with this training? Um, and I think, I think Jason spoke to a lot of this, you know, where, when you were mentioning trying to operationalize APPs and find creative ways to staff. I know we're doing that currently at UCSF. We're hiring an APP team um, and a lot of places are as well for, to, fill, to try and cover that deficiency. Uh, and I also know that a lot of places are interested in trying to expand their training programs to try and anticipate or getting more doctors to the to these teams. Jason, or maybe Chris, you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I think one thing that's important, I, I think that especially about 
um, being an early cardiac intensivist can be very difficult. And I think that the piece of advice that I would offer is to really talk to whoever you're potentially going to work with and make sure that what they're looking for and what their goals are align with yours. One of the greatest challenges I've ever had is trying to, uh, um, cardiologists and intensivists think very differently and the administrative and operational structures of critical care medicine departments are dramatically different than cardiology departments. And depending on where you land, if you work in cardiology uh, and you're gonna be a cardiac intensivist, it's likely your cardiology leadership will not have experience with the operational and structural elements of critical care medicine. And these are, there are a lot of administrative operational ch challenges that, that arise. And that those are many of the things that I, I'm sure Jason dealt with also. I, I, I'm now at the second program where I'm the, the, uh, the you know, helping to, to uh, guide forward a critical care, critical care cardiology uh, program. And I, the challenges I'm finding are, are nearly identical. And uh, so there, it's it's hard and I expect bumps and uh, have a lot of conversations and reach out to people who have done it before. I, I think that's about the, the, the best that can be done. Yeah. So in the last few minutes and trying to be respectful of everybody's time, I didn't want to miss an opportunity to plug for a few things because there's been, you know, I, I think you, everybody's getting a sense. There's a lot of growth, a lot of opportunity here. Uh, and in addition to... You know, working at the bedside, there's a lot of the things that Chris and Jason have been part of now for a while are turning into very well organized and oil machines that create opportunities for trainees, professional tra opportunities. Um, and maybe Jason, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the fact that we actually have our own section at ACC and some of the early initiatives that are coming out of that. Yeah, this is great. I mean, for the longest time, we've been sort of looking for a, a home, a home for a, a, a clinical uh, work, a home for community, a home for our investigative pursuits. Um, and so we're starting to do that. The, you know, I, I had the fortune of being, or I'm now the immediate past chair of the Acute Cardiac Care Committee of the AHA. But now thanks to the efforts of uh, people like Chris and Mike Solomon and Rob Roswell and others, there is now a dedicated critical care cardiology section of the American College of Cardiology. And, uh, you know, we, we sit on the leadership council uh, for this initial sort of block. Um, but I think it's going to be a real great opportunity for us to be able to, um, to talk together, to sit together, to break bread together, to discuss all things critical care cardiology from a research standpoint to an education standpoint, staffing structure, where we take the field and, and an opportunity to do some really fun things like, um, you know, try to sort of hijack a little bit of the ACC conference just geared to critical care cardiology, which uh, Chris is helping to do and, you know, to, to get some of our sessions specific uh, to the field. And we actually, um, um, are going to have opportunities to do that at the next ACC meeting, I understand. And, um, and I think that's, you know, sort of a really exciting opportunity for us all. And I'll, you know, I'll throw in also that other professional societies are increasingly interested in critical care cardiologists. Jason and I were both at a consensus conference at the ISHLT, uh, where critical care cardiology uh, was, uh, or, or there are a number of critical care cardiologists who made a, a meaningful contribution in a space that I think pre previously would have been dominated by heart failure uh, specialists, primarily heart failure specialists. And I, I'm a member of the uh, AHA, this three CPR leadership committee, which is also uh, expanding the uh, the uh, offerings of uh, in critical care cardiology at the upcoming AHA meeting. And, and those are, I, I think the examples kind of go on and on and on. There's just enormous interest right now in this space. Um, it took a long time. We, we've sort of, uh, uh, we, we kind of got to the top of the hill and now we're kind of rolling down. It's getting easier and easier and, and the interest is uh, growing very quickly. And the, so is the opportunity. Excellent. I'm just fielding some, um, the, uh, so there's some questions here. There's questions about how many weeks we do. Uh, I do 20 weeks a year. Chris does 20 weeks a year. Jason? I do about uh, uh, eight to 10 weeks a year in the CICU and about six weeks a year in the CTICU. And then, and then I, I am advanced heart failure transplant cardiologist. Um, and so I, I run the VAD program. So I round on that service as well. 
I, I'll throw out that there's this is an active area of investigation. We're about to send out a survey to our new ACC section membership to and to try and understand better what critical care cardiologists are actually doing, and uh, some work will be done in the next in the coming months to try and figure out uh, once we have some information about what we're doing to figure out what we we should be doing. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of this remains unclear. And I think we're, we're seeing wanted to answer one of the questions. Looks like. No, sorry. I think I accidentally clicked on something. That's definitely uh, for you guys. <laughs> oh, you sure you don't want to answer that question? I was super hoping you would. Uh, this was just asking about hybrid models. And again, that's an area of really active investigation and uh, publication. I, I participated with a group here at Duke that were, and others that were interested in just speaking about opportunities to form hybrid fellowship models between heart failure and critical care. There have been publications on interventional and critical care. This is what I speak to when I talk about the fact that we need to be a little bit more nimble and malleable if we're really going to invest in the field uh, from a uh, uh, provider perspective. Um, and this is not an area without controversy either. A little bit depends on where and how you want to practice, what type of institution, what type of patients you want to care for. But, you know, I think we should be open to discussion and I'm hoping we'll have more uh, public forums to discuss this openly uh, so we can come up with the best best way and again you know for those interested in, in education or education and training man quite a fertile area for um, for uh, a job yeah and, and to dovetail on that a little bit also is the the question that I saw earlier of what other activities we do besides critical care and Jason mentioned his I I have also uh, on the way, managed to board and heart failure, uh, advanced heart failure transplant. But I do exclusively write heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. So in my last institution, I ran the PH program. In addition to running the cardiac ICU here, I, I, I'm a, a participant in the pulmonary hypertension program. And Sam Brusco, who's joining us, will also be a PH attending in addition to the CICU. So often, I think many folks who do critical care also choose a second specialty area of uh, practice, echo, and, you know, imaging. It could be a lot of things. It's very hard to do critical care all the time. Uh, Connor is an example of someone who has managed to do that um, in, in a remarkable way, but it's a very hard thing to do. And having a second skill uh, and a second area of practice that doesn't require being in the ICU is oftentimes desirable. And many institutions are looking for that when they hire. Yeah, and I know uh, like Alex at uh, MedStar, he does a lot of echo, right, on his off time. That's something yeah. he carved out. He did a little bit extra echo reading, uh, CoCats 3. So speaking of sort of hi hybrid models, there's a lot of opportunities uh, depending on the institutions you go to. Uh, real quick, in the last little bit of time, I know since we have uh, three other things I want to put a plug in for. Um, there are a lot of people who, do, who aren't aware of Cardiac Critical Care Trial Network. Uh, and that's a big consortium uh, that has, I forget, almost 40 sites in it now, something like 50 or 40,000 patient entries, and is growing quite, quite rapidly. And that's going to dovetail and uh, feed some of the AHAs get with a guideline cardiogenic shock registry. So for trainees out there, or people who are interested in getting joining projects that are fruitful and accessible, um, like Jason said, this is a big, happy family, generally like, you know, bringing as many people as we can. It's a little, unfortunately, poor Vivian who runs the network is getting overworked by all the people who are applying. Um, it's a good problem to have, but it's a fun place to be and lots of uh, very lively conversations at the, the investigator meetings. And then also there's another opportunity of just, this is uh, a new symposium that's gonna be annual. Both Chris and Jason are, some, are the inaugural directors of this. And it's NY, sponsored by NYU Critical Care Cardiology Symposium is a very large multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary event, uh, really highlighting what a lot, Chris and, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. This year, you know, this year it'll be hybrid. Last year was all virtual. So this year we'll have in-person and virtual participants. We had like over 900 virtual participants last year, which was incredible from countries all across the world. And last year was the actual, the inaugural one. This year will be the, the second uh, second one, hopefully bigger and, and better. Jason Katz is giving the keynote speech during the symposium. So I, yeah. this, is, this is how we're, this is the carrot to come and join us is to see Jason <laughs> Katz talk for half an hour. Yeah, no um, pressure. No pressure at all. 
So real quick, I just want to say a quick thank you to Leanna and Jamal uh, for the opportunity to do this and Leanna for doing all the coordination as usual. Really appreciate all your efforts and ACC in particular for being so supportive. It's a really great opportunity to be invited to put something like this together and be able to work with people who I've respected for a long time. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. And uh, thanks for uh, allowing a Durham, North Carolina guy to, to break into the California party. <laughs> Yeah, thanks also, Connor. It was a fantastic experience. We'd love and, to and hear it again think, sometime. I, and I think we all mean it. You know, we put our emails there. Feel free to reach out at any time. And personally, if I don't respond right away, uh, uh, hammer email me. You won't hurt my feelings at all. Yeah, that's it's the same thing. Anthony, did you? Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, Jamal is gone and I'm the Southern California guy, but, uh, uh, and I know this is a NorCal representation, but Connor and Rasheen came to us with this idea of really getting emerging specialties um, uh, into our California content, if you will. And I can't be more pleased with the inaugural uh, emerging specialty program. I can't think of a better one. I, I was taking notes as chief of cardiology here at Loma Linda on how to build our, uh, our, our CCU program. And I have Dr. Soccer here who runs our CCU. And um, I certainly learned a lot and I'm really excited and, and very pleased with the work you guys did this evening. And I can't wait for this fall uh, where we have our, our, our next emerging uh, subspecialty program in cardiology. But Connor and Chris and Jason, thanks again for spending your evening. I know on the East Coast it's quite late. Uh, but yet again, uh, we appreciate your time very, very much. So uh, I'm, I'm gratefully indebted to all of you for doing this. I feel the same way. It was, it was a privilege. Thank awesome. You.